You're so cool. We're going to change your slides. Ich stoppe. Ich stoppe. Ah, okay. So, I will stop. Uh, thank you for the time. <laughs> I will read it another working group. Hello? Hey, Leslie. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see my slides uploaded. Or did you approve my slides? I uploaded them to MOPS uh, a couple days ago. Um, you should, they should be there. I thought I just uploaded them. When I click on, hang on. Sorry, when I click on meeting materials in uh, Meet Echo, I see slides for the chairs and I see slides for Dash Web RTC, but I don't see the uh, slides for SVA. Have you refreshed your browser? Because I uploaded the rest of them about 10 minutes ago. I just logged in about three minutes ago. <laughs> well, well, I see them. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> um, let me leave and try to come back then. <laughs> yeah, and, and if it doesn't work out, then... Um... I, I can, in theory, anyway, if I've done this correctly, I can share them and you can do the next slide thing. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of waiting for Kyle, but ah, there he is. All right, uh, I think we'll get started. Welcome to the MOPS Media Ops Working Group Session. Um, your co-chairs are Leslie Daigle, myself, and Kyle Rose, who is hopefully online successfully from an undisclosed location on vacation. <laughs> um, before we get any further, we'll do the usual, uh, the usual introductory materials, but I will tell you now that at the end of the introductory materials, I will stop until we find a volunteer to take notes. Uh, again, this is the, just, I, I need a designated stucky who will be in charge of making sure that the right stuff lands in the shared notes document. Um, the rest of us can be in there and helping write. So you don't have to do all the work, but I need somebody who will be a stucky. Um, okay, so, but do note well that this is indeed an IETF meeting. For those of us in the room, it almost feels like an IETF meeting, except that we're missing all of you who are not in the room with us who also probably feel like it's an IETF meeting because you're up at some unusual hour and on video. Um, 
So, but as a reminder that there are requirements in participating in an IETF meeting, um, following IETF processes and policies, I refer you to BCP 79 for all the details. This is a pre-see summary of some of the things that you agree that you are uh, agreeing to um, in order to participate in this meeting. And a particular note, um, now that we are actually within, within arm's length of each other, um, we need to remember that we are working respectfully with each other. And if you observe any disrespectful behavior or are the uh, subject of some disrespectful behavior, we do have an ombuds team and uh, please do reach out to them in order to uh, help resolve any issues. All right. Um, and lots of RFCs to give you the full documentation on what that means and where to go and who to see. All right, we have an agenda and I think I skipped a slide. Oh, great. We have the slides, but this isn't the right set of slides. I think I know what happened. Hang on a minute. It's the wrong version. Um, so I want to do, 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 do. <laughs> There's the understudy. You, you're you're not unmuted, Kyle. So Leslie, on the uh, slides, it, it turns out when you go to the slides view for Meet Echo, um, using that refresh button in there does help. Um, logging in, logging out, you still get an old version of the, the the overall materials, but you need to give it a kick. not the right version. All right. All right. So do we yet have a volunteer to take notes at this session? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I'm not seeing any hands up online. I'm not seeing any hands up in the room. I can do that just more All right. Thank you, Sanjay. Sanjay is volunteering to lead until 4 p.m. I think that means that we better get this meeting over within 90 minutes. I've got a quick question. All right, the AD is sorting that out and I've got to get, Glenn, can you tell me how you refreshed your view of slides? Because I'm not seeing the updated. Yeah, in, in the uh, media materials tab, up sort of in the, the yep. left view of it, there is a reload media materials right. twisty. Thank you. Madam Co-Chair, right. yep. are, are remote attendees eligible to take notes? Uh, yes, they are. <laughs> just, just so you don't have to make eye contact with everyone. <laughs> I, I understand that. Um, okay, hang on a minute. I'm still trying to get back to the agenda because this is, this is all just killing time so that you can talk amongst yourselves and figure out who's going to be stucky after 4 o'clock. Uh, All right, one more time with feeling. Um, and I will, I will help take notes uh, after four o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so this is the slide that I wanted to make sure to uh, get to. Um, I think by this point in the day, it's possible that in-person participants understand that um, you have to scan the, uh, the QR code is the fastest way to sign the blue sheet for this session. Um, but otherwise, you can just log into the on-site tool, um, which will also log you into our blue sheets. It's how we know how many people were here and we can plan for future meetings, so we would appreciate it if you did. Uh, plus, also, we will be running the question queue out of the Meet Echo interface. So by signing in using the on-site tool, you will have access to raise your hands. Uh, if you just show up at the mic, you'll be showing up at the mic. If you want to speak at the mic, you have to put up your hand and we'll go in the order uh, that the Meet Echo queue shows us. Okay, 
I think that is, uh, and yeah, remote participants, please make sure that your audio and video are off unless you are sharing, presenting, or asking a question. Um, okay. And Kyle's undisclosed location has terrible internet, so, so he'll just have to make do. All right, so the agenda we have noted well, um, we have not bashed the agenda. We do have a scribe, we have a minutes taker, uh, Jabber scribe, is somebody, somebody willing to say that they'll keep an eye on the chat? Well, Eric's nodding his head, so I think, yeah. okay, Eric will make sure that we don't lose track of the chat. Um, are there any further bashes to the agenda? I did sneak something in just before the meeting, the late ad noted under working group docs, the discussion of AD review comments on the OpsCons document in case there's any material there. All right, then not hearing any bashes to the agenda, I would invite uh, Magnus up to tell us about the mock meeting. Yep, I'm Magnus Westland. I will talk about the media or quick buff, which is on Wednesday at 10 o'clock Central European time. So let's go next uh, slide. So we Sorry about those online that gets to scratch it. So um, anyway, those for on-site, it's Grand Clean Tall 2. It's a non-working group forming boss. And the kind of high level goal is to judge the need and scope of interest in working one or more new media delivery protocol built on top of Quick. My co-chair is Alan Frindel. So let's go a little bit into depth here about what's this until the next slide. So the goal here is really to look for solutions for today's world. A significant reason for doing something here is really to anything in the new delivery protocol would be due to the evolving world. CDNs, good security models and authorization. The fact that it's distributed systems, there's a diverse set of clients, definitely built on top of cloud. All of those things that you need to think about and maybe that your incumbent protocols maybe didn't really see when they were built. So next slide. And it's quick. And quick here is really a facilitator. It has a number of capabilities that are attractive. Multiple, multiple extremes, unreliable datagrams. It's congested controlled. It has a good, reasonably good security with TLS point to point. Flexibility and reliability, all the way between full and partial, basically single shot datagrams. You have path migration to support clients moving between networks. You have user space implementation, making it fairly easy to deploy. Uh, so building on this can simplify the protocol and improve the possibilities to deploy. So. Uh, next slide. So the big question for the buff is going to be what to tackle, and it's it's a fairly, I mean, big range here. From and one of the major factors here is probably latency. From quite short latencies to that usually gaming, remote desktoping, and telephony video conferencing requires to live media. It's still fairly wide range from maybe 
just sub-seconds to tens of seconds, and we have on-demand media. Uh, just a personal observation here is probably the on-demand media is not targeted to this, but um, it's rather a question of how much of the above do we need to tackle. Uh, next slide. So live media is probably a starting point. And there's interesting things here around this. So this is pictures I uh, got from James Grusing, who's going to present for the boss. But it's looking at typical kind of basic case of a TV production chain for light TV all the way over to distribution of on demand over satellite terrestrial networks. Uh, and those bigger arrows are what's maybe interest here and what's related. So we have three different ingest arrows. And they all are different colors for a reason. Because there's some subtle differences here in requirements. Syndication. It uh, can be either distribution or ingest or it's something around there. It's also slightly different requirements. The content delivery with the streaming arrow there, getting the media out. That's a different, yet another set of requirements that's different. So, um, next slide. On top of this, we also have these kind of hybrid use cases. So, what's, it does exist beyond these evolving the classical use case, improving them. So, I call it hybrid because it's, use cases because it's combining aspects of several use cases. I think a fairly straightforward example here is corporate all employee meetings for question answers. You have the, the big guys up there speaking, 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 and then you get the questions and answers. And suddenly someone, okay, you want to ask a question and you want to actually let them ask live easily without any Kind of like, I mean, we notice here in the tech when you add some, there's a short powers, etc. Can we get something that works without any kind of clear change? So that's a case I think where live media delivery meets video conferencing. So there are more use cases like this nature, I think, the existence. But it's both positives. Does it get us a more useful solution? Is it more long-term evolvable? But can we do this without boiling the ocean? <laughs> Is it something we can uh, find the right scope to get a good start, deliver something initially, evolve? It's all questions. So next slide. So, nope. The slides is not. Yeah, so it's a lot of questions for this buff, but um, if you want to prepare, you could take a look at some of these documents that have some inputs or proposals, etc., or things that have been done to maybe better understand where people are coming from. So, um, yep, take care. I don't have that much more. I think it's, you're welcome to come to the buff on Wednesday morning. Uh, and have prepared with your questions, etc. Follow along the discussion, contribute with what's your use, etc. So, yeah, you can take the next slide. But um, so, any questions from in these sessions about the buff? Not trying to hold the buff here, but if there's any questions or things that you should think about. Yeah, if you want to get in the queue, please raise your hand in. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Then you can stand up and say. <laughs> no, it is. Um, Sanjay Mishra. Yeah. Um, on your very first slide, you had a CDN um, acknowledgement. So I know you, you were short here, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was short, details, but I mean, but yes. And I don't know if, if it's like, it's, it's CDNs are there, they're a part of a lot of the media delivery. And I, I think it's, it's our protocol maybe not acknowledge them, but if we're actually looking at system-wide view, 
you usually need something. How do you deal with the fan out? Who's this part of the fan out? It's affecting security and things like that about what security models can you have with the CDN going through those. Having multiple CDNs because if you're large enough, a single CDN is not enough. You probably have several, et cetera. Those kind of questions. These are things we need to consider, so um, yeah. Glenn? Hey there, sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, so one of the interesting use cases that I don't see on your list that you might want to consider if in fact this does become a working group or the work gets taken up someplace is the situations in which you end up having because of your media workflows and the practical reality of who's going to support quick and who might not, uh, there's a case where you have to do transitions along the media workflow potentially from quick to some other transport back to quick even. Um, and those transition points may be areas of either like a, a best practices document, or even maybe some innovation around the quick space um, around those transitions between protocols. It's just the reality of complex media flows that you end up with um, these like, you know, islands of things that don't support the latest and greatest and you have to sort of transition in and out, kind of like, you know, six to four <laughs> back in, the, in, 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 in that other world. So, so just a, that one comment. The other it's thing is, an excellent uh, like, consideration. Come to the buff and tell it there. <laughs> your, your timing couldn't be worse. 10 a.m. CET when you live in California is pretty painful. I, I'll try. We'll see. <laughs> no promises. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll highlight here, and then you may want to take back to your buff, uh, but I'll talk about it in the SVA slides that are coming up next, is the streaming video lines is, is putting together a quick uh, streaming POC uh, not to sort of do a bake off of the, the, the quick protocol, but to really build a test environment for media operators who want to understand quick and evaluate it against their current operating environment and understand what, what it means. So just a pointer over to that, and it may be relevant work to the stuff you guys are doing in mock. Okay, thank you. So Matt Wall? Uh, Mosin, I just uh, uh, chime in on the point about CDNs. Two of the drafts uh, going uh, into the BOF, uh, the quicker drafts do explicitly mention uh, relay nodes. Uh, they don't, I don't think they call them CDNs as such, but it essentially is a CDN. So they have an explicit uh, provision in the protocol for those relay nodes, their function, and how they handle publications and subscriptions. Mm. So you yep. want to take a look at that? Yep. Okay, thank you. So I think we're done here. Or no, Sanya, Yanni. <laughs> Sanja Mishra, uh, real quick question again to Mo. Um, you mentioned a uh, uh, couple of RFCs or something. Can you, do, can you repeat that again? Draft is quicker. Q-I-C-R. There are my references in this, in this, yeah. Okay, thank you. See you on Wednesday. Thank you very much, Magnus. Great, Glenn, you are up next. And I'm assuming you want me to drive or did you want to drive? Um, no, I can drive, I think. Um, okay. Sanjay's in the, in the queue. Does Sanjay have a question for me? Oh, Sanjay's out of the queue. Um, how do I drive? <laughs> I think you have Why to don't ask. you drive? Let's just be easy. No, you just... no, no, you can drive. All you have to do is you have to ask to share and I will let you share. No, no, I, I want to use them out of the, um, just out of, out of data tracker. All right. Uh, so hi there, I'm Glenn Dean. Let me turn my video on so people can see me. Hi everybody, I'm Glenn Dean. <laughs> um, and I'm going to give another one of our uh, updates uh, on the Streaming Video Alliance. There's obviously a, a, a considerable overlap between the interests of the Streaming Video Alliance participants uh, and the ITF. So uh, we've been doing these updates uh, now for quite a while in MOPS, uh, in fact, even three MOPS. Uh, and uh, just for your knowledge, I tend to do these updates the other direction too, over to the Streaming Video Alliance, so that they are aware of what the ITF is up to. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, for those of you who are not 
familiar with the good old SBA. Um, there is uh, about 100 members now. Uh, these are people that tend to focus on uh, the actual practice of delivering streamed video to people's houses. Uh, you know, the they, they people who participate are content studios, streaming services, technology providers, and CDN operators. Um, there's a very strong intersection between both these topics and the ITF, but also participants. A, a number of people, even in this working session, such as Sanjay, um, are also uh, very active over in the Streaming Video Alliance, as it, myself and, 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 and Leslie as well. Uh, so um, if, if you want to sort of position what the SBA does, it's a little bit like, uh, like an operators group, like NANOG, uh, would be to the ITF for protocols. Not exact match, but pretty close. And the working groups that the IT or the SBA uh, focuses on are the ones listed right there. Um, in particular to the ITF are things like live streaming and open caching, uh, which have direct tiebacks to the ITF, as well as a group I chair, the networking transport group, which is where the quick PLC is being done. Uh, we also do VR work, uh, players and playback, and privacy and protection, uh, measuring QE, all the kind of good stuff that relates to taking video and delivering it over the open internet to customers. Next slide, please. Uh, just so you're aware, as I pointed out, a few of us are around. So if you want to know more and have questions after this, uh, find Sanjay in the hall. I see he's there in Vienna. Uh, or find me. There is our email contact for both of us. We can help you understand the group and, 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 and build bridges. Next slide, please. So let's talk about a few things that have come out since we did the last update. Um, the last update, I talked a little bit about the open caching API uh, becoming available. Uh, it was sort of early release then. It is actually full release now. Um, there is a URL down there at the bottom. And this open caching uh, testbed is, you know, one of the key things the SVA has been producing is an open caching specification. Uh, and the, the, the APIs, and we have a lot of people in that room who are building the thing and deploying it. And so one of the, obviously, one of the important things is interoperability and the use of those APIs and the testing of them. So that we've stood up a service now uh, where you can actually go in and test your APIs uh, against a reference uh, testbed uh, and uh, to verify that they're up and working and doing the things they're supposed to do. Next slide, please. Uh, I also want to point out some open caching configuration interface specifications that came out uh, uh, officially back in the uh, beginning of March. There is three sets of them, an overview and architecture, uh, a extension to the CDNI, that's the ITF CDNI, uh, metadata object model, and the publishing layers APIs. And I also point you, if you're interested in these things, uh, go over and look at the ITF and you'll see, or sorry, CDNI at the ITF uh, mailing list, you'll see like, uh, documents and stuff that have flowed over from S SVA to the ITF around CDNI and these specifications. So there's a strong linkage there for us. Next slide, please. Uh, there's another paper I wanted to point out to you. This is a fairly long uh, white paper that the SVA recently published. It's around 5G and Edge Cloud. Uh, and it, you know, given the work the, S, the ITF has done around um, you know, network slicing and other things like that, I think there's a lot of interconnects here that would, the ITF community would find interesting to read. Uh, it's about 110 pages, fairly long. Uh, and it, we try to balance between a little bit of marketing, not a lot of marketing really, and technology without getting down to the weeds. So it really should appeal to the uh, ITF reader, uh, this uh, white paper. Next slide, please. So I mentioned this uh, when Magnus was talking. Um, one of the things you know we've been looking at from an operator perspective for delivering video is you know everyone's talking about quick, and from the ITF perspective, sometimes you know quick is like, hey, we, we shipped it, it's ready to go. From the adopter perspective, it's still early days in some cases, and so one of the questions that a lot of uh, implementers uh, and users of quick in their media workflows have said is. Well, this looks interesting, but it's a pretty big change for us. It's shifting from the world we know, which is TCP based, and all the optimizations we do there, and all the uh, you know tools we have for end-to-end -end monitoring and and problem fixing and detection. Those all change. What changes in my workflow? 
And so one of the things the uh, SBA is doing is producing a, a testing POC uh, that effectively is working to produce a sort of end-to-end -end reference evaluation architecture that would allow anybody who wants to evaluate quick for deployment in their media workflow to take that along with instrumentation recommendations and proof of concepts how you would do that in players and on servers and build that reference and document it uh, sort of test implementation for your company or your organization to be able to uh, use quick and do a meaningful evaluation of how it fits into your workflow. This is not meant to be a, you know, quick versus HTTP2. It's not, you know, meant as like, this is better, this is better than that other one. It really is an ability for organizations who want to adopt quick to understand the impacts and evaluate it. And so reference testing infrastructure is something that a lot of people identify. And so it's something we're working on right now to produce and publish. Next slide, please. And finally, if you want to get in contact uh, about any of these mentioned projects or slides or just information in general, uh, here's some contact points you can reach out to. Myself, uh, Sanjay, as I mentioned. Uh, there's also uh, Jason Thibodeau, who uh, is the executive director over at the SPA. Uh, and he can uh, you know, help point you and put you in contact with the right working groups uh, and, or tell you about what's coming up from the group. And with that, I'll take questions. Thanks, Glenn. So any questions in the room or online? Amber, hands up and meet Echo. I think you must have explained it all very, very clearly, Glenn. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for the chance. Take care. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, moving right along. Next up is uh, Julia Ken Kenyon. Who I think is online. Yes. All righty. Um, and I assume I am sharing the slides. Go ahead, Julia. All right. Video. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Julia Kenyon. I work for a company called uh, Phoenix RTS. If you've never heard of us, it's not surprising. Um, we do real-time streaming using WebRTC. And we've had a lot of use cases that intersected with Dash over the years. So last May, uh, a bunch of colleagues uh, joined Dash IF to talk about what kind of use cases we could support if we were to kind of integrate Dash and WebRTC. So if you pull up the next slide. Um, so there's a number of different use cases you can get from integrating Dash and WebRTC. One is fallback from WebRTC to Dash. So if the device doesn't support WebRTC, if the network connection isn't good enough to sustain WebRTC and you have to uh, do more buffering like Dash supports, um, or if someone's offering a real-time experience that's premium and someone's not paying for it, they can fall back to the more uh, the, the higher latency dash stream. There's also use cases where you use content that's interleaved, so you have real-time WebRTC and then you interleave that with Dash, so you're switching back and forth between Dash and WebRTC with add period or uh, say a pre-recorded content like a movie and then interactive periods where you talk to the movie's director, stuff like that. Or you could have content that's concurrent, which would be uh, overlaid pre-recorded ads or pre-recorded Dash content with supplemental live WebRTC streams or uh, a lot of co-watching experiences that people think are really cool because then you can you know, interact with friends that maybe are elsewhere. Not that we would ever need to do that for any reason um, Next slide, please. So just real quick, in case anybody's not familiar with WebRTC, uh, or generally knows Dash, um, where Dash uses MPDs, which has content uh, descriptions for everything that's available and is the uh, same for all users. WebRTC uses the SDP, which is unique for each client and typically only describes one audio and one video stream. 
in dash where the client selects the media and the bit rate and the codex, WebRTC uh, just negotiates the codex between the server and client, and the server is what's adapting the bit rate. In dash, subtitles and captions are standardized, whereas WebRTC, all implementations currently are proprietary. Uh, dash uses buffered and time synced timing, whereas WebRTC just immediately renders everything, doesn't do much buffering, and because uh, that always adds latency, which is, is bad. Uh, dash, even for low latency dash, you can get down to three or five seconds. Uh, WebRTC is usually less than a second, often less than half a second. Uh, dash distribution, of course, is via CDN, which is low cost and widely available. WebRTC servers are more boutique. They're using standards, but they're all proprietary implementations. And Dash has first libraries, whereas WebRTC is built directly into browsers. So most people don't even need to download anything. Uh, next slide, please. So how would that work? Um, we've got for hybrid delivery, you'd have a publisher publishing live content. It would go up into the cloud, it's transcoded, packaged, gets delivered as WebRTC streamed through a scale delivery system and to the subscriber. That same content can get pushed out into a Dash manifest and chunks and delivered via CDNs, or pre-recorded content can go into that same processor for Dash, which provides a manifest and chunks and to the CDNs to the subscriber. So that's pretty straightforward, but of course, all these boxes contain a lot of details as you would normally expect. Next slide. And the client would be more of a WebRTC client kind of grafted onto the side of a Dash player. So you'd get your typical Dash player getting MPDs and segments. And then that would talk via a set of APIs to a WebRTC client, which is the standard stack, uh, an HTTP client, a WebSocket, that then talks to the WebRTC server. And they just go back and forth using a set of APIs that still need to be defined. Uh, next slide, please. So the workflow would look like this. So the Dash player gets the MPD, which then comes back with a set of WebRTC adaptation sets. The Dash player would pick out which, which tracks it likes. So if the MPD says, hey, there's a German track over here and an English track over there, it would know your preferences or you'd ask you and you could select one. It would send that information about those specific streams to the WebRTC client which then does very standard SDP negotiation, except that that's not standard yet, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, does, does SDP negotiation, then establishes its WebRTC connection, establishes a WebSocket connection, and then media starts flowing from the WebRTC media server, as well as events over that WebSocket. Okay, next please. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, the current state of real-time streaming, the WebRTC stream is standard, but getting there is not. So if you want to connect to a system that's doing WebRTC streaming, you need to get some kind of proprietary manifest. And the system, the session negotiation is also proprietary. So you can't just take any client and connect to any server. You need to have a bunch of stuff before you get there. And we would at some point soon like to make those more standard so that clients don't have to all speak the same language as their specific server. Okay, next slide. So WebRTC has got a lot of work to do um, as far as uh, the standardization efforts. So a signaling protocol, which is currently in work as far as the, the WIP protocol, um, which is a bit, much, a bit like an ATM machine. Um, so there needs to be a standard session management protocol. There needs to be some kind of stream switching that doesn't require starting over again with SDP negotiation. Um, there's a bunch of work around time, synchroni time synchronization with Dash and collecting metrics. So Dash clients collect a lot of good metrics that would be good for WebRTC sessions to also collect and then translate those into existing metrics and then send those via the APIs that were in the system diagram. Okay, next slide, please. 
And dash means to determine the APIs that go between those WebRTC clients and the dash clients. Deti define how WebRTC information gets presented in those MPDs. Decide whether Dash and WebRTC would both render to a single browser video element or switch between the two, and support hybrid operations between Dash and WebRTC. And I think that's the last slide. Oh, sorry. Okay, so Dash IF worked on a report that summarize that there's a summary of that report at this link. The full report is at the other URL, and we also have an interest survey where we're trying to find out which people are interested in this for in furthering the standards work that we've defined and um, what use cases they're interested in. So I would encourage everybody to at least look at the summary. And if you even if you don't find it interesting, please fill out the interest survey because one of the options is that you're not interested at all. Great, thanks. And yeah. and if you've been following the chat, which I'm sure you were doing while you were presenting, not. Of course. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's some suggestions that this looks like it's got some good overlap with, with mock, so hopefully you'll be able to make the mock off on Wednesday. Um, Probably not. So, yeah. <laughs> Glenn, Glenn, I think you have a question. Yeah. Yeah, hi there. Um, nice presentation, Julie. Thanks. Um, Glenn Dean here from Comcast NBC Universal. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, one, in this sort of workflow, this hybrid workflow, how would trick play, like the ability to pause, rewind, jump back to live, what's the vision for that? And then, do you want to take these individually or shall I ask them all at once? Oh, if they're all if they're all connected, then I would just ask them all at once, and then we'll we'll see which ones I remember. Uh, and back. the other one was, um, you know, the, the watermarking is done today through Dash Manifest with the with the AB trick, AB selection trick. Um, any thought about how you do that in this world? Um, well, I'll start with trick play. So, trick play the way we. The way people are doing it right now is you're you're on the live edge and you're watching you know what happened say on the football field just a second ago and you can pick which kind of football you you like uh american or, or real um ouch so <laughs> sorry not sorry um so you're on the live edge and something happens so you want to back up but then you have an option usually in UI to pop backwards. When you go backwards, you're you're then going into the dash world, right? So then you're in the dash world, you can scrub, you can do all the usual things you can do in a recorded stream. And then when you watch and see, oh, that's why that guy got a red card or got a flag, then you can then pop back to the live edge and then you're back on WebRTC. And, and so with the web, so I noticed in your media flow that you had a web RTC both being um, packaged as a dash manifest element, but also a direct delivery into clients. Um, how would the direct delivery into clients work there? Would they basically see a black black box of the web RTC content during the trick play or? There seems well, to be a synchronization a problem, is I guess where I'm going with ultimately. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of one of the things that we want to work on in, in additional, that's kind of the, the further work, additional reading kind of thing we need to work on. So what what we do uh, is we'll actually just have, an, we have a, an app that just shares a window and either the WebRTC client or the Dash client or control that window at any given time. So okay. it's not really synchronized, I guess. I mean, they're, you, you're not you because you can't get the dash data at the, there at the same time that you get the lower to see data that's you know that's kind of the whole the whole thing is that okay, dash that is always going to be delayed right yeah so so an observation that we did we talked about what i'm working in two, two, one, one question one right. observation one observation is potentially you might run into some um if the code rates or like the 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 uh, the WebRTC versus the Dash content, or a different uh, 
frame rates or different, uh, you know, different hertzes, um, you might run into like some weird interaction there that you'll have to sort of synchronize in addition to the time synchronization, but the frequency synchronization. Um, and then the, the, that's the observation. The question is, and why I assume you're referring to real football being Canadian football when, when you make that comment. No, no. No, Australian rules football, actually, but yeah. Okay. And so, and so, and then the, the question about um, how would you potentially do uh, the watermarking uh, um, at, at this point? Um, at, at this point, we don't. Um, so that's another thing that would be good to kind of hash out as far as would you have completely separate streams or would you just say Live Edge, we're not going to bother with that or, you know, do some other way of content protection and then just do the the AV selection on the dash side. I'll point out we, we use watermarking so. also for like measurement and like oh, yeah. impact beyond content protection. Yeah. I'm 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 familiar I used to work at parents. Um yeah. So I mean you could you could still watermark the content as it's going through for uh if you wanted to put that kind of mark in in the right. So so you start, I guess what I guess the answer would be server side would be the answer to do versus client side. Yes. Okay. Fair answer. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Great. And Thanks. everyone can see Ellie's comment about everyone should uh, look at the report and provide feedback. So. And I'm wondering. Because I know you guys don't have enough to read already. <laughs> Does anybody else have a comment or a question to follow up either in the room or online? Not seeing anything in the queue. I will say thank you very much, Julia. That was great. Thanks, everybody. All right. Uh, next up is um, we're on to working group docs, and we'll start with the um, AR document. And I think Riemann is online for that. Yes. Um, Rena, did you want to present the slides yourself or shall I do it? Yes, please. Can you drive the slides? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Rena and I will be presenting an update to our draft. Uh, this is uh, joint work with Akbar Amman. Next slide, please. So the updates to the draft are in the abstract and the introduction. We will talk about the changes in the next few slides. Next slide, please. We have got a detailed feedback in the mailing list. Many thanks to Spencer, Rohit, Jake, Kiran and Ali. Uh, they provided both feedback and comments on the mailing list. We have responded point by point to the feedback on the mailing list. We will now discuss our proposed changes in response to the feedback. Next slide, please. We propose to replace the term augmented reality with the much more broader term extended reality. We believe this reflects the scope of the document more accurately. We will discuss the scope in the next slide. Extended reality is a term that includes augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. AR combines the real and virtual, is interactive, and is aligned to the physical world of the user. On the other hand, VR places the user inside a virtual environment generated by a computer. MR merges the real and virtual world along a continuum that connects completely real environment at one end to a completely virtual environment at the other end. In this continuum, all combinations of the real and virtual are captured. Now let's look at our proposed scope of the, of the draft as well as the intended audience. Next slide, please. It was pointed out by the reviewers that the scope and the intended audience needs to be defined first. Depending on the choices made, the draft can take different parts. 
So this is our proposed scope. This document explores the issues involved in the use of edge computing resources to operationalize media use cases that involve extended reality applications. In particular, we discuss those applications that run on devices having different form factors and need edge computing resources to mitigate the effect of problems such as a need to support interactive communication requiring low latency, limited battery power, and heat dissipation from these devices. The proposed intended audience for this document are network operators who are interested in providing edge computing resources to operationalize the requirements of such applications. Next slide, please. So we'd like to solicit the working group's view on the proposed scope and the intended audience. We welcome other pertinent issues that the working group would like to include in the draft. Reviewers and contributors are invited to support the draft. The link to the GitHub repo is given in that slide. Many thanks to Kyle. So with the chair's permission, we'd like to open the floor for a discussion. Any discussion on what has been proposed here? Spencer is looking for the button. All right, Spencer is in the queue. This is, uh, I'm Spencer Dawkins, and I'm really struggling with uh, the first ITF out of the last four or five when I have not had two 24-inch monitors to go back and forth with. Uh, others here may feel the same way. <laughs> um, so thank you for this. Um, I did have one question um, that the uh, scope you proposed uh, seems, Focus, well, I mean, it, it is focused on uh, people doing whatever, whatever AR is um, that are going to be using edge computing um, for things like split rendering. Um, and I'm curious if there's anybody who is not, who is going to, who's going to try to be supporting AR, but not using edge computing uh, as a way to uh, support AR, and that's a question for the group, of course. So, clarifying question, Spencer. <clears throat> By not using edge computing, what are you suggesting? Or that they'll do it in in cloud resources, or, or yeah, I mean, any any other way. Some of which people in this room may be inventing on their laptops now. Uh, that you know, I, I I guess I'm kind of asking. If, if there are such other ways to do this, do we do, you know, do we expect, are we planning to expand this document or write another document about, you know, doing it through cloud or what like that? And I'm, like I say, I'm mostly asking uh, for the working group to think about this. And uh, I have been where uh, Renan is, uh, and, you know, and so have Ali and, and Jake. Um, as far as, you know, you've got a work group document and you're not getting a lot of input for it. And um, it really, it really improves the document when, when the rest of the working group is paying attention. So, I, like I say, I'm, I'm not asking the authors to make me happy. I'm asking the authors to make the working group happy. Right. Renan, do you have any thoughts to share or? Yeah, uh, I think, um, the use of edge computing essentially uh, comes into play when you are talking of uh, offloading computationally intensive stuff, uh, which uh, might result in uh, heated equipment or uh, limited battery capacity, so the battery runs out. Uh, in addition to your uh, standard uh, requirement for uh, very low latency in such applications, so what we see uh, going forward is that the edge computing uh, solution is an overarching umbrella 
under which other possible things can also be added to. Uh, so I've had discussions with people who suggested uh, things like uh, multipath uh, TCP, uh, just you know, just throwing that uh, to the working group. Uh, but uh, we we do feel that edge computing has this uh, 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 umbrella-like property where you you can do a lot of things uh, once you have solved the problem of uh, uh, of highly computationally intensive uh, applications running on your device, and you have just offloaded it to a nearby set of edge servers, and then you can use all sorts of clever tricks including adaptive uh, bitrate algorithms to, to further mitigate the, the problem. So we do feel that edge computing is, 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 is a key thing, but I'd like to hear other people as well. Yep, I'm, I'm scanning around to see if other people have comments to make on that. And it looks like Jake does. Go ahead, Jake. There we go wrong button. Uh, okay, so it, I thought our remit was more about media and less about edge compute. There's like the CoinRG work, uh, research group uh, that's doing some work on edge compute. Um, are you looking there to refine uh, edge compute use cases? If that's the sort of direction you think is, is right to be headed? So I, I thought the question was slightly different. I thought, and, and I could be way out of line here, but I thought it was more that because, because the computing is being offloaded to the edge, there are different media delivery expectations and requirements um, than there would be if it wasn't being done on edge computing. Not, not the question of you know how to do the computing there, which I think would be the purview of a different group. Yeah, okay. Could be. And and then Spencer's question was, if you weren't doing it at, at said edge device, but we're doing it somewhere else, like in the cloud, and he's going to come and explain to us where, uh, then the delivery requirements might be different. And therefore, would they be covered in this document or would that be managed in a different document? Spencer, uh, you wanted to follow up? Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, Spencer Dawkins again. The, um, so the thing I'm wondering about is whether, so CoinRG is a great research group, but it's a research group. Uh, they can't, they're not chartered to produce IETF standards, among other things. Um, so I guess my question here is, um, do we, it, it, you know, are we talking about engineering here? Or are we talking about research? And even if we're talking about engineering, this is an ops working group, which is an odd place to talk about the engineering stuff. Many of the comments that I had on this draft, uh, ver previous versions of this draft, were not arguing with the draft. Uh, it was more like, are we sure that we've you know, got this draft these draft, this draft contents pointed to the right research group. I note that uh, MOPS is also chartered, correct me if I'm wrong, but MOPS is also chartered to provide input to protocol working groups about uh, gaps in protocols and things like that. Uh, I wonder if we're not looking at a, a situation where that's the case here. Uh, because if we're if we're pointing you know if we're pointing to a research group as the best sort of input that we've got, that kind of that kind of makes me wonder if it's not if this is really uh, engineering or if it's research. Eric. Eric Ring and Spencer, you may discover something indeed. So to be honest, I need to read, read the draft and the changes and the charter, uh, but it's something we need to pay attention to. That's a given. Thank you for this. So I, I certainly agree that if we're off into that kind of research space, we should revisit 
Um, but I'm, I'm also smelling potential rat smells, as in we might have fallen down a rat hole. Um, I, I pulled up the document, and uh, I'd, I would have to reread it again with that lens as well. But I think that the I think that we are focusing on the XR side of it and not on the what's actually pertinent here, which is the media challenges, given that the the computing isn't being done on the device, right? So you're creating, and I'm uh, I'm looking at the screen. I'm sure that that doesn't help Brian at all, but the <laughs> but the it's only so virtual. The the fact that you are trying to create this immersive environment and aren't doing the compute local does create a different cloud of realities uh, for streaming the media. And I think that's the area of focus and interest here. Um, Renan, does that sound at all like the document that you wrote? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, when we talk of operational requirements, I would include things like how many edge servers do you need, for example, to support some use case. Um, and what are the kinds of uh, uh, protocols that you might use to, to support those use cases and uh, what are the limitations of those uh, protocols. So uh, these, all, these all questions arise when you start to think about operationalizing uh, use cases such as the one that we have presented. Right, thank you. Uh, I see Colin in the queue and I see that Spencer would like Suhas Nandakumar to be in the queue. Colin? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think this document sort of is operational. I mean, I, I view it, I, I don't, you know, edge compute and cloud compute, really all you're talking about, it, I mean, as far as this document's concerned, it's compute and it has a different latency going to it. You're talking about the operational latencies of where you put your compute, um, how much latency there is to that point. And that's not related to anything that's going on in CoinRG or anything. It's just like, yeah, there's going to be some compute and it can be different latencies as way. And, we can use that to trade off against things like power and heat on headsets and you know whatever that all seems very reasonable to me it seems to be in in the scope of what we're talking about here thanks thank you colin uh, and i see suhas has joined the queue please go ahead hey uh, can you hear me yes yeah i, I could not say no to answer one here um i, I just wanted uh, renan to look at the Computer aware network, compute aware networking box, which kind of uh, captures edge computing and what, how can you kind of offload some of the work to the edge node? Might be something useful there. Not sure. Uh, thought, thought of sharing the thought. Great. Thank you for the Thank pointer. You. And if my memory serves, and it probably doesn't, that's on Wednesday of this week. See? Told you my memory was suspect. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, Spencer, you're in queue. So I'm not going to check the agenda before, you know, and, and Leslie's memory. Um, th this is this is Spencer again. Uh, the, the thing for me, I think, is uh, looking at the draft contents. Um, most of the things past the introduction haven't changed a lot. And there's a very interesting description of why latency uh, targets are tied with AR. Um, and then there's, an, uh, there's a description of the T, you know, TCP considerations, which what it says isn't wrong, but you know, if you're doing AR over TCP, that's, you're going to bump into a lot of buildings. Um, but for us to, to for us to really think seriously about um, what's needed here, and I I take Colin's point that there are people in the world who do this every day, um, so may, I have no doubt that there is engineering work to do here, um, and that if you stood in the right place and squinted hard enough, it would be operational engineering <laughs> work to do here. Uh, but like I say, I just, I'd, I'd like to have us have a really good sense of what, what the right scope is for the working group document before we do a lot more wordsmithing while we're still talking about the scope. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, and and a side note, um, you your memory your memory wins. I just looked it up. It's the Canboff is tomorrow. That will not happen again. <laughs> um, but the so to the point about scoping, I think we are fairly clear on scope, and I think the challenge is determining how to make sure that the document stays within scope. Um, and the big move between the last IETF meeting and this IETF meeting was the move to get this into GitHub so that we can pursue it more um, methodically. So um, I'm pretty sure that Renan would appreciate some help in going through and identifying sort of which areas align well with um, the scope that we've agreed, which is media delivery in an operational sense, um, and which areas maybe are a little less directly related to work in this group. So wait for it. Volunteers? And Spencer's looking around the room too. Well, I, uh, but but you you're at a you're at a you're at a computer, so you could actually stare meaningfully at the, the, the people who are yep. remote. Yeah. Um, I'm willing to uh, help with this, but I think the I think the really important thing for the for working group contributors, which is more than me, uh, to be writing uh, issues rather than PRs at this point. Right. I think and I think, I think that uh, we should applaud Kyle for setting up the repo for this draft, and uh, we should do the right thing after that. Yeah, and, and certainly fair point about, um, I can see the list of people in the room, um, <laughs> because, I mean, one of the challenges as we've been working in this mostly remote mode has been really getting that sort of cycle of motion going. So I'm a little concerned that we'll walk out of the meeting room today agreeing on what needs to happen here and then we'll have the same discussion in a few months in Philadelphia or remotely in Philadelphia. Um, so I really like to make sure that we agree, having agreed that this is a working group document and that there is working group work to do here, let us do some working group work here. Um, and if the right thing is to say, right, for the next month, and I would say it's the next month, not the month before the July meeting, for the month following this meeting, let's focus on identifying issues and making sure that we can get this document to line up with, with you know, we know what needs to be covered in order for this document to be useful and aligned well with our working group charter, then, then I think that would be helpful. It, uh, and maybe uh, having a side, uh, sidebar conversation with uh, Jake while uh, everybody else is listening. But Jake was talking about the difference between uh, media delivery and what it takes to do media delivery. I think that I think that was his point um, in his statement. And uh, for us to, uh, I, I would suggest that that was a uh, really useful uh, filter for us to uh, use to think about uh, what we should be doing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, let me let me jump in to clarify then. Um, I, it, 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 I was I was stalling so you'd have time to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes the buttons are tricky. Um, so I, I I take the point. I think there. I think uh, what Colin said is is right. There is some uh, you know, some good ops work to do here, I guess I would. So my, uh, one question is like, how central is the compute uh, offload to this? But another maybe way to focus here is to like, think that it, it presumably there is some component that that's there and to talk about like, uh, what are the kind of bandwidth and uh, latency and reliability requirements around that, I think, would be a kind of useful direction to flesh out. Like, what you know, if you tried to run a system like this, then what kind of network are you going to need? You know, and can Wi-Fi do it? And like, how many, how many, uh, you know, how, how what are the scaling considerations? I guess as well, because you know. I imagine this museum tour that you've written about, uh, you know, if you try to bring a hundred people instead of 15 people, then, you know, 
what's that going to do to your to your Wi-Fi and or is it even Wi-Fi? I don't, I'm not I'm not really sure what the state of the art is here. So I'd love to see more about that in the doc and kind of what can be achieved with what with what kind of parameters at a quantitative level, I guess. Um, do you need me to put that in a GitHub issue or is, can you take care of that? <laughs> but I tell you what, if you could capture some of that in the meeting minutes, it would be most helpful because I think those are good broad level questions to use as sort of a, a review set of questions going through this document. So it's not just all think, in to, to answer your questions, but I think it's, it's, they're a good set of questions. Sorry, Kyle, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think it's probably worthwhile to put it in a GitHub issue as well, just so it doesn't get dropped. Sure. <laughs> all right. So I think that was a helpful discussion and some helpful pointers to where from here. Renan, anything else you would like to get out of today's session? Uh, no, I would like to thank everyone for participating in the discussion. Uh, and uh, just wanted to reiterate that we, for this iteration, we only focused on the abstract and the introduction because we think it's, it's uh, really important to fix the scope of the document and also to, uh, to fix the intended audience. And so that was the goal of this particular update. And uh, to Spencer, uh, we have taken your uh, comments about uh, the TCP section on board and uh, we have replied to you on that point as well. But really, I think uh, uh, our goal is to make sure that everyone in the working group uh, agrees with the scope and the intended audience and we can then take things forward from there. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll look forward to further discussion on the list and in the Git repo. Um, OK. So that brings us to the, uh, the late ad discussion item. So thank you, Eric. You sent some comments as an AD review of the draft ITF MOPS OpsCons. Um, I think that there's material there for the draft authors to work through, but I didn't know if the draft authors wanted to spend some time either talking to some of the points or asking further questions. And I'm going to assume that everybody here has read that discussion on the mailing list because you're all subscribed and active contributors. Go ahead, Spencer. Yeah, Spencer Dawkins. Uh, and noting that there are two other uh, draft editors on the on the uh, here in, in uh, Meet Echo. Um, so I invite them to help me think. I looked at Eric's uh, comments and almost all of them I knew what to do with. The only one that I did not know what to do with was uh, his observation that some of the description of latency seemed overly latent um, in the draft. And uh, after a spirited uh, conversation on email between me and Ali, uh, one of the other editors, uh, I've convinced myself that, what, that the definition of latency categories in the draft, which was uh, hammered out at great length uh, in, this, in this working group, is reasonable for streaming media. And uh, we can talk about whether we should even be, even mention video conferencing as a streaming application. But um, I agree with Ali that opening the conversation about uh, latencies is, in the context of this draft, is not the right thing to do. Um, so I'm given that, I think I know what to do with pretty much all the uh, comments that that Eric made. And uh, thank you, Eric, for being general, and um, let other people um, express opinions about any of the other comments that um, may have been made. I, I'll just go ahead and say this now, if if I can. Um, I have been living with the 
nice people that are doing the mock buff. And the latency categories that they're talking about there are not the same, you know, not necessarily the same world as operational guidance that we would we would provide to existing people who are doing video streaming uh, today. And so, like I say, I've, I, Ali convinced me that uh, we're talking about two different problems and it's okay to not change stuff in one description just because of the other thing we're talking about. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric. Yeah, and it, all my comments I think are pretty minor. They are more the editorial side and really technical. Uh, for me, I have two things, the latency. I really want to point you on this. If you confirm that you are okay with it, I'm all set, right? You are the expert, I'm not. And the other point is about the living documents. And we got the discussion this morning within the ISG. We have not yet a way to do this. So it will most probably be static when, it, when it's published. Maybe we can change it at all 48 to get some refresh. And then after, we will need a bis. We hope to get something more coming in the one year, two year, but not for this one. Yeah, so so it will be great to have a general IETF wide answer to the question of what to do with living documents. I, I will just throw out that in an earlier draft of this, <laughs> in, an, or in an earlier draft of this, there was a discussion with uh, John Levine about how to refer to things. Um, and I think that's a piece of the puzzle as well. Oh, and I see that Warren is about to, Warren's head is about to crater. Spencer, Spencer is in the queue, though. Okay, uh, this is your regular host, uh, Spencer Dawkins. And uh, so if I'm remembering the conversation that we were having correctly on the previous version of the draft, uh, it was using something like tiny URL to generate the URLs. And so the question was, what happens if tiny URL goes away? Um, so I think that one reasonable suggestion which if people tell me it's not totally crazy, I would likely put in a PR for, uh, would be to uh, create a dead pointer to a living document. <laughs> and, that the, and that the dead pointer, which would, not be, uh, which would not be updated, would be pointing to a document maybe in the mock GitHub or something like that. Uh, where we where we could maintain it, where we could maintain uh, the really very useful list of things you ought to be following and things you ought to keep an eye on uh, that are that are now in the draft. Right. If if not everybody has noticed that because it was added in fairly recent revisions, uh, it's worth taking a look at. But I think it's really I think it's really useful for us to provide that to the readers. Uh, and if we don't have to drive the RFC people crazy, um, yeah, if we so can solve it. Or yeah. If we can solve our problem ourselves, maybe we don't have to wait for that. Thank you. Yeah, well, some of the implications and ramifications are the reason why I would really look forward to an ISG solution for this across the board. Because in a previous life, I was known as Our Lady of Identifiers. <laughs> um, and I'm trying to get over that. <clears throat> but this is servicing a lot of the challenges with, you know, what is permanent, what is, I mean, heck, let's get into document formats too um, <laughs> while we're at it. And um, yeah, so let's, <laughs> I'm not really not trying to drive Warren under the carpet. Did you need the mic, Warren? I'm gonna let Warren have the mic and then we'll get back to the queue. Uh, somebody's going to have to cut me off because otherwise I'm going to go on a 20 minute rant. Um, so we've tried to do the living documents thing a few times and part of the problem seems to be that everybody's got their own use case. Mm -hmm. So figuring out exactly what the use case would be seems like an option. Um, I think the easiest thing that we came up with last time was there is one document which is owned by the chairs or someone and they just update it to point at the most recent version 
of another document, which seems to be what everybody kind of agrees is the currently best viewed. It's like the chair's kind of determined consensus that you know this thing is what everybody kind of agrees at the moment, and they just have a document that points at that. It's incredibly messy and ugly, but it at least gets you something for now. Um, but if people have the stomach to have the living documents discussion again, that would be really useful. Uh, I still think it's worth doing. It just sort of is one of those endless discussions like document formats that just dies. Yep, no, I, and I think that the real challenge there is to have the discussion in the broader context than, than the MOPS working group, so. Yes and no. Well, I yeah, mean, I, I understand the theory. Problem, as Spencer suggested, yep. we could just solve our problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the issue is there's like 47 different use cases. Yep. And if you have the broader one, everybody's like, mine's the most important. Yep. And clearly the MOPS one is the most important. Well, naturally. Because you've proven the short in the short. All right. Uh, Glenn, you're next in the queue. Oh, sorry. Conveniently, Spencer, you're after Glenn in the queue if you really wanted to say something. <laughs> um, a couple of things uh, in, in, in no particular order. Um, on the latency discussion, I agree with the comments Ali made. And I'm, I'm glad Spencer came around. Um, overall, you know, latency is going to be a moving benchmark uh, because it's an area of a lot of operational investment by uh, various parties, both in standards and also in technology, to move latency into uh, ever ever lower numbers. So it's always going to be a moving thing. Uh, on the discussion of living documents, um, you know, one one thing MOPS should consider if we're going to do this sort of isolate alone. Uh, and not try to solve the bigger picture, which I, I agree with, um, is also the concern though that if uh, the ITF does get requests for uh, citations by lawyers and, and, and signed, you know, what happened when, um, that whatever solution we decide in MOPS should be able to support uh, those legal frameworks that the ITF does get pinged on occasionally uh, by law firms. So as a consideration. And GitHub probably is not the best place. <laughs> I've said my piece. Right. Thanks for that. Spencer, did you want to? And then I think we will, unless there are other, unless there are other issues with the document. We'll... Uh, and, and this, this is on, this is on that one. Uh, the, my, my, uh, my question is just, I'm not going to raise. I'm not going to raise my hand about this at the plenary, right? We all agree. <laughs> okay, just making sure. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So I think that that was useful discussion around the points in um, the MOPS AR. No, sorry, in the OpsCon docs. Sanjay, did you want to jump in on? Oh, yeah. This is Sanjay. Just real quick. I mean, the the decision on living document does not have to be made. I mean, if we should publish the document, of course, if there's consensus. And if after the publication, there's a really good use case that we think belongs in that document, then we can always, you know, revisit it. But I don't know if we want to consider this as a like living document, you know, forever. Yeah. All right. So I think, I think Eric, you correctly identified the two major issues <laughs> with the document latency and the zombie document problem. Um, Okay, then thank you very much for that. And, and I'll take this opportunity too to say thank you very much to Sanjay, who is the document shepherd and did all the work to do the write up and get it to the ISG. So thank you, Sanjay. All right. Um, and now we should move on to the milestones discussion. Um, I wanted to, uh, to get there because the current state of our milestones, I won't say is woeful. There are certainly more woeful milestones lists. And, and of course, you've, you've all seen these because I sent all of this to the mailing list on Friday-ish. Um, so I've just noted here the, the items that are uh, either, either seem to be out of, out of scope or whatever. So we, were, we had as a list on our list to last call a document on SM Simti's use of our reliance on our protocols. Since we don't even have a draft of that, <clears throat> and Simti seems to be moving away from some of the uh, really IETF related work at the moment, I think that it just doesn't seem to be, I, I don't think we should have this on our list at all. I think we should punt on that one, revisit it when there are more in-person meetings for both the IETF and Simti, 
um, and, and see where to go from there. For the streaming video alliance document that also doesn't exist yet, um, I think we move it out a little bit because um, I, I, I believe we have updated a possible pointer to a plan. That's enough layers of indirection to cause that document to, to exist. Um, and I think that by July we should be in, we should be possibly even seeing a draft of that document. So that's my proposal there. Um, we have done two of our milestones. Um, and um, yeah, the November 2021 SMPT one also out because it didn't happen. Um, and then there was a Bogon. Um, I think that there was a miss, we just didn't clean up the milestones properly last time. Um, and we do have a revised um, AR use case document. So all of that markup is kind of messy. And the net net is that I'm proposing this for our updated milestones. Um, we don't actually have to decide this here, but I would certainly look to see if there's any discussion or pushback or thoughts um, that um, I'm, I'm cleaning up the milestones this way. And I'm assuming that was our area directors agreeing that these are the most stunning, awesome milestones they've ever seen. Yeah. Go ahead, Colin. Uh, I was just going to ask, uh, just an informational question, just what, how do you imagine the dr drafting the reliance, the SVA reliance, what do you imagine that looking like? Is that just like a list of references of the stuff they use that we're doing or what, what, it, what was that? What does that look like? So um, I think it's useful to know what things, what the relationships are between the work that we're doing and the work that SVA is doing. And, you know, we've had reports every meeting from SVA saying, you know, we're doing this and this is how it touches some of the IETF protocols. So, for example, the work on CD&I with which Sanjay is intimately familiar and, and it was referenced in, um, in Glenn's presentation earlier. So, sorry, dry air, I'm going to cough. <laughs> Um, it's, I think the important thing here really is to understand how entities that are doing more evolved things with video or more industry specific things with video are relying on our protocols so that we have some understanding of, you know, who, who our users are and, and what we might like to take into account. I don't think it's directive in any way. I think it's entirely informative. Okay, so look, I mean, I just as two examples of ranges of the spectrum for WebRTC, I kept a draft that just had where the status of where all our all of our drafts and RFCs were that the W3C could use to look at that there's and it had everything that the W3C depended upon that for WebRTC. Um, and that was one in the spectrum and then the other end of the spectrum back when we we're doing a lot of SIP stuff. I mean, the liaison managers kept an amazing Excel spreadsheet that was reviewed at every, you know, every three months in a formal meeting. Um, so I, I, anyway, and both of those turned out to be really useful. So I'm not right. quite sure what you have in mind here, but it was useful. Thanks. Well, thanks very much for those suggestions. And uh, I think we'll certainly keep them in mind. And I think somewhere, perhaps somewhere in between, and perhaps there's a little bit of a backing story in part because, you know, part of the goal is for people to know that the SVA exists and for the SVA to remember that we exist. Spencer, you're... Is that a new queue? It's a new queue. Thanks, Colin. Uh, this is Spencer Dawkins, and uh, this is actually just a follow-up for Colin's thing. Uh, I, I had mentioned earlier, you know, we are chartered to provide uh, input to uh, protocol working groups about uh, gaps and deficiencies in the protocols that people are trying to use. So I think that um, the producing that document for someone who's trying to do more than just show a you know show a show a video uh, is is a really useful first step towards saying do I, you know do we have do do we have everything that we need uh, or you know or is there other stuff. Um, we haven't really talked much that I that I can remember about uh, gaps, and I think that um, having MOPS members participating in the mock pop uh, on Wednesday is going to be a really good opportunity for uh, that kind of input to happen. Uh, I know we have 
one person from the broadcast uh, type business uh, that's been active in discussions about and mock, but uh, a lot of other kinds, a lot of other kinds of, of operators uh, that haven't haven't been represented at all. I think it'd be useful to have that uh, in a non-work group forming buff. Yeah. So I think part of what I'm hearing and what you're saying is that um, maybe we shouldn't expect to be last calling the document a couple of months after the first draft appears. Um, so the November 2022 milestone should probably be moved out or changed from last call to an update or something. Yeah. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Um, I will send that update to the mailing list and you know gather whatever comments, other comments show up there. Give it a couple of weeks and plan. I think Kyle and I will confirm that we, it looks like we've updated milestones and then do the updates. So with that, um, is there any other business? Not hearing any other business. Going once, going twice, and I asked Kyle a couple minutes ago, but I don't know if he's lost his connection. Uh, it's been fine since I've uh, switched to my tablet and uh, had my video off. So, right. but I don't have anything else. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the important bit. Then I will say thank you, everybody, for coming virtually or physically, and um, yeah. Close, officially close the meeting. Thank you all. But they were, they were, as soon as I said, they just moved away. They were very friendly. They just didn't notice. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Warren. Hey, how are you, sir? I'm fine. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Enjoying the service? Yes. Are you aware? Yes. Dot and L is